Do 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 do. Okay, welcome to another reading vlog. I'm going to read some of the Man Booker 2018 long list. The reason being that I've just done a reading vlog for, or two reading vlogs, um, for the Women's Prize 2019, which, even though they have different years in the award title, they are based on the same books, roughly. Uh, there's a lot of crossover between the years, but so I've just read the, yeah, the Women's Prize 2019, at least the ones that I'm interested in, mostly. I do also have Milkman by Anna Burns, which is the one that connects the two because it won the Booker Prize in 2018 and it was shortlisted in the Women's Prize. So these were the other books that were at my library that I was interested in when I was looking through and trying to decide which ones I wanted to read from that prize. We've got The Water Cure by Sophie McIntosh, Everything Under by Daisy Johnson, The Mars Room by Rachel Kushner and Sabrina by Nick Drenaso. Drenaso? So the first one that I have read is Sabrina by Nick Dren Dren Drenaso. Um, so <laughs> So this one is the first ever graphic novel to be long listed for the Booker Prize. Um, I'm not a big graphic novel reader. I think looking at pictures doesn't do it for me. I can understand why people do like graphic novels. I mean, certainly there are more visual readers and I can see why the graphic novel is such a powerful format for storytelling you know, in a world where we do all learn differently and we all absorb information differently, but it's not my way of absorbing information. I will say, though, that I enjoyed the story that was going on. So we're following mostly a gentleman who has taken in a friend, an old friend from school who he hasn't spoken to for a long time. Um, he's taken him in in his spare bedroom uh, because this poor lad has just lost his girlfriend, his girlfriend of two years, went missing. And then whilst he's staying with this friend, it turns out that she's been murdered and her body is found. And a videotape emerges where someone has literally murdered her live. Well, not live, but videotaped it. And then sent it out to all these news outlets and press and, you know, just like posted it on the internet before taking his own life, uh, which is horrific. But what we're really focusing on, like the theme that goes through it is how the conspiracy theorists come out and how they start to say, well, this is all faked and was Sabrina even a real person? And the person who killed her was actually being forced to do it by some sort of government conspiracy. And like all these things start coming out and then how that affects not only the, the boyfriend of this woman who was who was murdered, but the sister and her family and how they're being targeted by the conspiracy theorists um, and then this gentleman who's literally just taken in an old school friend and given him a place to stay how it starts to affect him and how these conspiracy theorists hone in on him they find out where his um, his ex-wife and his daughter live and you know basically to him start threatening them so it's it's quite a hard topic it was very engaging, like I was really invested in it. I felt like the ending was a bit anticlimactic. It sort of just, you get to a point and then it just skips forward four months. To show how, whilst they've moved on with their lives and they're starting to do stuff and they're getting on with things and life goes on, these conspiracy theorists are still there and it's still affecting them. And then, I, so I think the big question for me is, would this have worked better as a novella, as a novel? Well, I don't know what format it would take. Um, or do I think the graphic novel was the right thing? So for instance, there are many cases in here where here we have a whole page where the gentleman in, who's lost his girlfriend is listening to a radio show that's by these conspiracy theorists. So in some ways he believes some of the stuff that this guy is saying. And then obviously when it starts turning to information about his own girlfriend, how angry that makes him. So it, it like the pictures are quite repetitive because you're just watching someone sitting down listening to a radio. And I was thinking, but how would you convey that in, in more of a literary format, more of a written format? 
would it be any better? I think it would, like for me personally, it would. Like I think I would prefer to read this story done as um, either a novella or a short story or something. But as I say, I do appreciate why people, so it's not my favourite, but I can see why people do love this. I would love to try other graphic novels and see if there are any that really take me. I know everyone's gone mad for Heartstopper, but I'm not sure whether I'm that interested in Heartstopper. Um, I have watched the TV series and it was very cute, but I don't think I'm particularly interested in reading the graphic novels. But if you are a graphic novel fan, let me know. I've seen there is some horror. Is it Jun Junjito? Maybe I'd like Jun maybe I'd like horror. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> um, I don't know which one. I don't know at the moment which one I'm going to read next because I'm reading something else. I'm reading from the next year on. I'm reading Frankenstein. Um, so I don't know which one. It might well be The Water Cure because this is the one that has been on my personal sort of radar the longest. So it might be that one, but we'll see. I'll come back to you soon. Book two was The Water Cure by Sophie McIntosh. I didn't realise, but I believe this is her debut, which is pretty amazing and this is exactly the sort of creepy um like unknown horror type book that I love it reminds me so earlier this year I read leave the world behind by Ruman Alarm which has that same creepy what's going on outside the walls of the location vibe to it this is is told from the perspective. So I'll read the, I'll kind of read the back to you because it's kind of hard to explain, but I will read the back to you. You are a girl. Your body is vulnerable. Men will break it if they can, and out here they absolutely can. Bodies must be controlled in order to be safe. Suffering will prepare you for the worst. The cure is nothing compared to what you have been spared in the sickness. It takes a lot of love to hurt you like this. Now come outside. It's time to play the drowning game. So yeah, so it's <laughs> really... A look at women's bodies and how we're hurt and love and what we do in the name of love and things that are said to be done in the name of love but which aren't really very loving. It's told from the perspective of three sisters and it's split into three parts but the first part alternates between a choral voice of the three sisters so we then you and then you also have the eldest two sisters, Leah and Grace, you never hear specifically from the youngest sister, Sky. She is only ever used in the choral voice. So that's part one where they're sort of setting the scene about what's going on. The second part is where some men turn up on this island where they've been alone for as long as they can remember. I don't think even the oldest sister has any memories of life before the island or what they think is an island. So it's very isolating there's a lot of stuff you don't know because you're hearing from the perspective of the sisters. There is an awful lot of stuff that you don't know that they've just been told and they have to take on faith. But obviously as the reader and us knowing what life is like in reality, it makes us question whether these things are really going on, whether this is like a dystopia. And so these things are actually happening per the book or whether the parents are just keeping these ch these these girls somewhere where they won't ever know that what they're being told is not correct, if that makes any sense. So the second part is told um, from Leah's perspective, the middle sister. And they have this like creepy game that they do where each year they redraw names and each of them gets a name of their most loved person in the family and then for the next year that is the person that they have to give most of their love to. <laughs> but there will always be one person who isn't given any love. And it's, you know, the parents suggest that it's somehow teaching them a lesson. It's some sort of therapy. But Leah is the one who, for this year, has is being given no love. Even though she constantly tries to give love, she's desperate for touch. She will take on any of the other therapies for her sisters, you know, where they have to be hurt as part of the therapy. She will take it on for them. If they have to hurt someone else, she will take it on for them. So we're listening. So we're reading from her perspective during the second part. And then in the third part, where the mother has also gone missing, um, we're back to being split between, uh, I think, Grace, Leah and the choral voice again. Oh no, Grace and the choral voice. But yeah, it you never really find out what's going on. There is a lot of unknown. I recently watched this documentary about liminal spaces and the creepiness of liminal spaces, which is essentially 
things that feel normal, so like a shopping centre or something, but which become creepy when they're taken out of context. So a shopping centre that's empty or fluorescently lit corridors that never end and things like that. And this has that feeling of like liminal space where it feels so real and so normal and yet it's not normal. There is something really creepy going on. So yeah, I really, really loved this. I can see why it was a booker book <laughs> because it has that sort of slightly different way of writing the way in which each of the chapters are from a different perspective and then you also have a choral voice the dystopia element and the themes that it that it's like playing with in terms of love and there's a lot of imagery around rotting and I think that really plays nicely with how they've distorted the idea of love and so all these things that should be like abundance and, and like fruitfulness become images of rotting and decay yeah there's lo there's loads going on in here and there's even a section where I think it's the second section and it's on the first day after mother disappeared on the second day after mother disappeared and it goes up to the seventh day and it really just gave me like bible feelings and these religious feelings and the way in which it's quite cult-like in this family and the way that the dad is portrayed as almost like a god and yeah there's, there's so much going on. I really loved this one. So, yeah, so I mentioned Leave the World Behind. If you've read Leave the World Behind, I think you'd enjoy this. And equally, if you enjoyed this, I think you'd like Leave the World Behind. It also gave me vibes of Woman Eating by Claire Coda, which came out this year as well, which is another one that I really, really loved. Although that one has less of the unknown. You kind of know what's going on, but it's got a similar feeling in terms of explorations of who you are and things. So... On to the next book. Okay, I've read the third book, which is Everything Under by Daisy Johnson. Now, this is actually very similar in writing style to The Water Cure by Sophie McIntosh. Um, and then um, also I would say similar to Rest and Be Thankful by Emma Glass. I would say I did really like this. I really, I would really like to read some more of Daisy Johnson's writing, but I felt this got a bit rambly. I felt that it was being stretched out too much without any real payoff on that. It's a retelling of the Oedipus story. And if you don't know what that is, it is about Oedipus who ends up killing his father and sleeping with his mother or marrying his mother or something. It looks at things around transgender, living on the waterways. <sighs> I don't know, like... Part of me didn't like the way that people who live on the waterways are depicted in this. Like, I do think there's definitely going to be um, an element of those who live in very rough ways. And um, a bit like how, you know, in where when you live in cities and things, there are going to be homeless people and, you know, people who, who aren't as, say, civilised as other people. But I feel like this stereotypes people who live on the waterways as people who aren't civilized i don't think that's what daisy johnson meant with it but that's the impression that i got from it and having read um an uneasy paradise which is an, uh, like a photographic essay from people called sebastian and louise i don't think they go by second name i think they just go by their first name which is one of the best non-fiction books i've read this year i love that um which is all about living on the waterways and the issues facing those communities. This felt a bit too negative. Oh, I don't know, like it's really hard. Like, I just, I don't think I enjoyed this very much, but I am intrigued by Daisy Johnson's writing is essentially what I'm saying. But yeah, I didn't enjoy this. On to the final one then. I have officially finished <laughs> all the books now. So I've just read The Mars Room by Rachel Kushner. And that is the last book in this little vlog. But because I've read so many, when I finish telling you about my thoughts on the Mars Room, I'm then going to do um, a little ranking of all the books that I've read for these two years. So the 2018 Booker Prize and the 2019 Women's Prize for Fiction because they're the same. They're technically the same year. <laughs> so the Mars Room. This is one of the most gut-wrenching books that I have ever read. I, I've read some pretty dark stuff. Um, I've read some sad things. I've read books that other people say make them cry. But I just... I don't think I'm like an outwardly emotional person when it comes to reading books. Even if something sticks with me and I think about it a lot, 
I don't tend to get really upset while reading stuff, but this book really did. And I think the reason for that is because it related to mothers losing control of their children. So the book takes place within a women's prison, um, but we're learning about the story of a central character who went to prison when her child was five years old. Um, and then when she's being moved to another prison, a young woman, uh, a very young woman, I think she might be just 18, has a baby whilst they're literally in front of everyone. She goes into labour, has the baby. And then while, you know, during the 48 hours that she's in a hospital bed, while she's asleep, the baby gets taken away and goes into the care system. And these women are then basically, de like, if there's no other family to take care of the children, these women are essentially just like cut off, especially where, like our main character who was serving multiple life sentences. They're basically cut off from knowing anything about where their child is going or, you know, being able to stay in contact. It is just, that's it, you're cut off. Um, and that was just so, like as a mother, that just really gets to me, things like that. So obviously being in a women's prison, there are a multitude of different crimes that have been committed. So there are some women that you don't necessarily feel sorry for. There are women who have hurt their own children purposefully or say to, you know, to get back at partners. As, like they basically use their children as pawns in their, in their crime, which is awful. But to be, and so you, you don't really feel sorry for those characters, but it's these women who, it's, it's more about the situation that society has sort of imposed on them. So our main protagonist. It's pretty obvious from the beginning. It, it does unravel through the story, but it's pretty obvious from the beginning that essentially she was being stalked. She was, um, uh, I don't know, a stripper? Maybe not a stripper, but like a, a lap dancer in a club. And a gentleman becomes obsessed with her, starts to stalk her. And she moves across the country somewhere else with her child, um, with a partner that she's thinking that she could settle down with. And this guy basically finds her and she ends up beating him to death you know she's she's terrified she's she she's scared for her son and yeah she beats this guy to death and goes to prison and no consideration is taken in, into the fact that it was to some extent self-defense obviously it's not exactly self-defense but these are women who are completely sidelined by society police don't really care about them the police are, are quite corrupt in this book anyway. So yeah, it is quite a hard read. It is pretty engaging all the way through. Um, but then, so I was originally thinking this was gonna be about a four star for me because it really educated me on an aspect of society. So as I, as I was reading it, I was like, surely this is not real. Like surely these sorts of societies don't happen, but I think they do. I think this is, this is real. Like in America, there are communities of people where this is reality. So I was gonna rate this quite highly because it educated me on something that I didn't really know very much about. But then I really just hated the end. Uh, I won't tell you what happens at the end, but it just sort of fizzles out. This Something happens and it could, you know, it could really go either way, but the way in which it was executed was just really nothing. And sometimes, so when a, when a book can be anticlimactic, you know, for instance, I found Jeanette Winterson's Oranges Are Not The Only Fruit quite, quite anticlimactic. There are many books like that that I really enjoy and stay with me for ages afterwards and that I can't stop thinking about. But it's because the anticlimax actually says something about reality, about how human lives really work. But in this case, it I don't feel like it did anything. I'd love for someone to tell me what that ending was about, like what, why that ending was the way it was, but it just did nothing for me. And the other thing that I found really confusing, now this might just be me com being completely ignorant because I can't understand. There are certain chapters, that are, they're quite short ones, but they're dotted throughout. They're from an unknown character's perspective not in the prison, not say one of the characters or it's not talking about one of the scenarios that we're sort of reflecting on from our main character's perspective. It doesn't seem to be for anything. I have absolutely no idea why it's there and it's not explained, like <laughs> nothing comes of it. They're just these like three or four chapters that are something else. What's that about? Please tell me. 
please help me understand this. So yeah, so for me, this just really fell flat. So let's move on to, I have my list here, all the books that I have read, either read before I started this challenge or have read as I've been doing these vlogs. And we're gonna go from worst to best. The worst one, in my opinion, was Ordinary People by Diana Evans. This was the one I DNF'd while doing the vlog on Ordinary People and Normal People. That was for the Women's Prize vlog I did. Yeah, I just, I just couldn't get on with Ordinary People. It didn't feel engaging, it didn't grip me. I think, unfortunately, I'd read some similar books around it like nearby and it just didn't live up to those and so I was like I just I DNF'd it in the end because I couldn't be bothered. <laughs> then the next one is Ghost Wall by Sarah Moss. So this one I can see why people love it but it just really wasn't for me. I don't really know what else to say about it. I just it, I didn't get on with it. The next one is Everything Under by Daisy Johnson. Again I can see why people would love this. I would like to try some more of Daisy Johnson's writing but this particular book just didn't do it for me. I didn't really like the way, I mean, I've already spoke about it in this vlog. You don't, you don't need to hear that again. So the next one is The Mars Room for, by Rachel Kushner. So this last one that I've just read. So yeah, I did prefer this to Everything Under by Daisy Johnson, which was a hard one to, to judge because as an overall book, as a story, I mean, as a, as a narrative, I preferred Everything Under, but the reason I liked the Mars Room better is because I feel like I learned something from it. I feel like I was educated by that book. Uh, the next one is My Sister the Serial Killer by Oyen Cambraithwaite, which I didn't read as one of these vlogs, but I have read previously. Um, and here we're starting to move away from books I didn't like. So the all the next books I have really loved. Um, so Oyen Cambraithwaite, I read, I think back in the year it was published. Uh, listen to it on audio and that was a really amazing way to to read it. It was a brilliant audio book Yeah, I loved the way it was written like it's really snappy and and jolty Yeah, really like that one. The next one is Circe by Madeline Miller Now this is one that I read quite a few years ago must have been around the same time that it was published But because I wasn't so so into literature as I am now I was sort of a bit distracted It was sort of on a break where I wasn't really reading very much and I read this and I did love it, but I wonder whether if I read it now, I'd get more out of it now that I've really started to unpick some of my reading tastes and I've really started to enjoy literature from, on a different level. I wonder whether I'd like it more now than I did when I first read it. Then we've got Sabrina by Nick Trenaso. Now, I really didn't know where to place this in this list because when I read it, I wasn't too sure, but I do love what it did. And I've been trying to think, like, would that story have been better in any other format? Um, ever since I read that one. And I actually think the graphic novel was quite a good way to do it because the pictures were quite, were, were almost boring, but that was actually quite impactful in its own way because these people are dealing with grief and it just captures the way time almost doesn't exist anymore. When you're going through something traumatic, I've never been through grief like that, obviously. Not obviously, but I haven't. But I have been through moments where it feels like my life has been turned upside down and the way in which time no longer seems to exist anymore does resonate. And so I actually thought the pictorial, like I don't even know how someone would capture that in pure text. Whereas I think in the graphic novel format that really did work. And the story itself is not one I've read before, the way that sort of, when you've gone through something like that, the public takes it on and it becomes, and like, I've never really read anything where you're looking at the victims' families and how, I mean, you know, I've seen documentaries. I mean, I've just watched the Dharma documentaries and stuff and the adaptation. Adaptation, is that what you call it when it's, a, anyway, the, um, the fictional adaptation of, um, with Peter Evans in. So, so like, I've seen how the media and public interest can affect victims' families, but I've never sort of read a book with that in it, and so I did really love it. Sorry for the ramble there. The next one was The Water Cure by Sophie McIntosh. Really loved that one. That was, that was just the sort of creepy, uncertain type of book that I do really love. The, the way in which you're, you're reading about a scenario, but you don't really know what's going on in the wider world. It did really remind me of Leave the World Behind by Rue Men Alarm. That was number three. So number two is The Silence of the Girls by Pat Barker. 
these were all really hard to place because I found the Silence of the Girls more generic in terms of the storytelling. It was, you know, fast paced. It was easy to read. It wasn't challenging in in the in the way that my, uh, many of these other books have been but i do think there's something to be said f for that you know when you can take an important topic and i you can watch the video where i talked about the science of the girls because i did wax lyrical about it um when you can take these important things but also make it into something that's fast-paced engaging and that someone literally devours that's amazing so that's why that's number two and then the first place, which I was not expecting when I went into this, is Normal People by Sally Rooney. I I don't know. I'm just I'm actually really surprised at how highly this is coming out because originally I thought this might fall further down the list, but when I really sort of put it into perspective and thought about the way in which it sort of educated me on a topic that I wasn't that I don't know about, the way in which it was still fast paced enough that you wanted to like literally consume it and then the fact I mean I said this in the vlog where I read it it feels like a modern classic like it feels like Jane Austen for the modern day because of the way in which you could use it to explore contemporary society the things that it says about the pressures on people today the things that it says about academia the things that it says about relationships and how we deal with trauma and toxic family relationships the ways in which even when we're trying to be good to each other or better people we're trying to understand others we can still damage them <laughs> when I really like broke it down to try and rank them I was quite surprised but yeah that that one does come out on top there it is there it is I've got one more book left to read f that I own from this which is Milkman by Anna Burns which I'm not going to get to anytime soon. I know I'm not. I've still got so many library books to finish. So I'm not going to include that one. But at some point, I'll do a mini update to this video when I read it and say where it falls on my ranking. But yeah, thanks for watching, guys.